Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 18. Last week uh, we talked about being dwelt by the Holy Spirit, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that He lives within us from the moment of salvation. Then we began to talk some about the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I believe I probably explained the indwelling part pretty good, uh, but I think the infilling. Maybe we need a little bit more elaboration on um, I, I stressed how that uh, the disciples could be infilled by the Holy Spirit uh, for certain um, services, certain situations, certain emergencies. Uh, I referenced a couple of references in Acts, gave you a number that you could look up on your, on your own to see times when the disciples went in prayer or they faced a certain situation and it was like they got a, I compared it to the double portion of the Holy Spirit, um, used the picture of uh, Elijah and Elisha from the Old Testament. And these are, these are true things. The Holy Spirit can give you what we call a uh, an infilling, a double portion, that there's extra power or wisdom that you might get to face certain things or to do certain things. But let's take a look at Ephesians 5, 15 through 18 because there's more to this than I went into last week. Starting with verse 15, it says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation. Some translations may say debauchery or may say where there is excess. But be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. The Greek word there is play role. Play role. It means to be filled to the maximum extent. To, to make something full, complete, uh, full to the point of overflowing. Uh, an example that you might be able to use to picture this would be, say, if you've ever gotten fuel at the service station and for one reason or another you filled it up so full that it actually overflowed ran down the side of the car you would begin to get an understanding of what play, play role is, um, is saying there it's, it's filled to the maximum extent it's overflowing <clears throat> But to completely understand what this Greek word means, because it's not just a one-time filling to maximum, it's not just a, a one-time overflowing, it is a repeated overflowing. It, it is actually, this Greek word implies that it is an ongoing, continuous filling to the maximum with the Holy Spirit. So if you wanted to better understand what this might be like, if you could leave the service station and take the pump with you so that it is constantly filling your, your, your fuel tank to overflowing, then you would begin to understand play role. What the scripture is telling us here is that we are to be filled with the Spirit. We are to be constantly being filled to the maximum extent that we need. Now, the Spirit's part of this is that He will fill us to everything that we need and then some. Uh, picture this. If you were to not only 
be filling your tank fuel fully with fuel so that it's overflowing and taking the pump with you. But if you were then to have gas cans, you know, the old Jeeps used to have that little uh, place back there where you could strap a gas can on for those long wilderness treks. Um, if you were to take a gas can and strap it on the back of your Jeep that you could use to, you won't need it because you've got the Holy Spirit constantly filling your tank until it's overflowing, right? But now you've got this gas can full of fuel that you can give to somebody else. That would be an infilling of the Holy Spirit. You've got what you need. You, you've got more than what you need. The Holy Spirit is continuously filling you with himself, with his power, with his wisdom, so long as you are making yourself available to that. But he will give you these infillings that I mentioned last week, uh, that I gave you references in Acts uh, to see occasions when the, the disciples uh, got an extra, extra dose of the Holy Spirit for, for a certain service or for, for a certain circumstance. Um, but that, that would be a picture of what the gas can have. Now that's the Spirit's part. He is there. He is available. He will do that so long as we're allowing him to. But in this scripture we find that not only is this a continuous ongoing thing to the max that we need and the more that we need so it can overflow to others, but we find that we have a part. And he's telling us, don't do this. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. This, this being filled not only gives us a picture of the Spirit's ongoing, continuous infilling of us, different from indwelling, because He does live within the believer. We are His temple, but He is infilling us with power and wisdom. But it also is giving us a picture that we should be consumed with the idea of being infilled by the Spirit. It's something that He is doing, but that it is so essential to our life as a believer and so much a blessing to our life as a believer. It is the strength that we need that we should be so caught up with this infilling, seeking this infilling by the Spirit that we're consumed with making ourselves available to be infilled by the Spirit. Any questions on that? Because I want to make certain we're really clear, clear about indwelling and infilling. To give a little bit more example of this, Let's look over in uh, Romans chapter 8. service. Gave you some examples of special circumstances with the apostles, uh, with other believers in, in the book of Acts, which is, is really the history of the early church and uh, what the uh, apostles and disciples and the Lord was doing to get things rolling and to spread the gospel around the world. But it's not just for these guys that walked and talked with Jesus while he was on the earth. It's not for... <coughs> Somebody that's called to be a pastor or some other great role for the Lord, some, you know, a Billy Graham or, or something like that. It is essential for every believer for their life and, and for their service to the Lord. Um, so let's take a look at Romans chapter 8. Should be familiar to you because um, this, is, this is recent uh, sermons by uh, Brother Blake says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. 
For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you, referring to believers, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of <coughs> God, you will live. So as believers in Jesus Christ, as those who have received the forgiveness of our sins, as those who have joined the family of God. We've got a relationship reestablished with God. We are believers. We are now indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. Therefore, we are receiving what we need first off to live the Christian life. And then what we need for any area of service that he calls us to. Now, I want to point out something here. And, and, you know, we've heard these messages recently from Blake, so this should not come as any big new revelation to us. But a person that has become a believer in Christ is a new creature. The scripture tells us that all old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. This passage tells us now that even though we, we, we are in the flesh, we are no longer subject to the flesh. We have the Spirit of God within us, and that is the one that gives us the Spirit of life that leads us into righteousness. We are made righteous with God when we are saved. We are being made righteous with God as we live this life on earth by the work of the Holy Spirit, and ultimately we will be righteous with God when we are in our new bodies in heaven with Him. It is an ongoing process. We have been made righteous. We are being made righteous. We will be made completely righteous. According to what we see in this passage here, because we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, we are now under the influence of the Holy Spirit. We are free from the life of sin. Now, let me explain this very carefully. A Christian, because a Christian still has a flesh, still has moral body, still has the junk that goes along with that, might commit a sin. A Christian will not remain in sin. You might commit a sin. The Holy 
Holy Spirit will bug the stew out of you until you get that right with the Lord. Hey, I messed up. I need your forgiveness. I need your power to overcome that. To keep going in the Christian life and in whatever service you call me to. You will get that right. You will not remain in sin. Because you have been made righteous and you are being made righteous for the Holy Spirit. You do have, it is completely scriptural to say that you can live a life of sinless imperfection here on the earth. A Christian will not live a life of sinful imperfection. If someone says they are a Christian, and Lord knows we probably all know oodles of them. And this person is not exhibiting any good fruit in their life, they need to check up on their salvation. You need to be witnessing to them. You need to be praying for them. They need to be checking up on their salvation. A Christian will not remain in sin. It is not possible with the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in you. You might say, well, you know, I know so-and-so, and they used to be a, 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 a preacher and, and, or a deacon in the church. I can't tell you how many people I know that used to be deacons that are <clears throat> foul-mouthed, <clears throat> booze-drinking, dope-smoking, reprobates now. I know a number of them used to be deacons. I seriously doubt, since this has gone on now for years, that they ever were Christians. They are not going to remain in sin. Can a Christian make a mistake, particularly one that, that has battled addiction before Christ, and, and, and slip up and, and Go back to the bottle, get drunk, or, or go back to some drugs and, and, and slip up. Sure, sure, they still have this house of flesh, but the Holy Spirit of God is not going to let them remain in there. Might they need some uh, uh, help to get out of that situation? Well, of course, uh, addiction is a very powerful thing, whether it's drugs or alcohol or pornography or Sec, other sexual sins, these things are all very powerful. And because these were weaknesses in their life before Christ, we well, think Satan's going to use to try and get to them, right? The weaknesses that they already had in the flesh. The Spirit of God is not going to want to remain in I know people that have been preachers. Oh, this person used to interpret the Word of God. He used to come for miles around to hear him speak. And then they straight off, they just quit with, with alcohol. Uh, some of the older ones I've known, some of the younger ones I've known, right back out in the world doing drugs. Were they ever saved? Since this has been ongoing for some time, I would say no. Now, I have known those that, because of things that happened in the church, because let's face it, what is the church? But a collection of people that are sinners saved by grace. Right? And of course we have within our membership any number of people that aren't actually Christians. That are merely religious. And of course there are some that are, are, are looking. Anytime you have a big collection of people you're going to have a little bit of drama here and there and now again. But especially if you have people that aren't Christians, listen, Satan loves to get his people in the middle of the church to try and destroy the church. It happens. And there are people who, who are tremendously hurt about it, and they go out, and they go away, and they stay away for some time. Are they going to remain away from Christ forever? Not if they belong to him. Sooner or later... You will see that they will come back. Maybe not that specific uh, group of 
uh, of Christians to worship and some other fellowship. Um, maybe they start a home fellowship in their own house. Uh, you're going to see some sign of fruit that they are indeed a Christian if they ever have been. They're going to spend some time in the Word or in, in prayer. And you're going to see some exhibit of fruit. You're not going to see people go out and become the polar opposite of what a Christian should be and remain there. It's not going to happen. It cannot happen if the Holy Spirit indwells you. He won't allow it to happen. Scripture tells us that uh, they've had people that have uh, gotten off into sin in the church and they refused to repent and be right with their sins. What did the Lord do? He took them out. Yeah, because that's because Paul said some sleep for this reason. In other words, to put them in the graveyard to keep them from being a stumbling block for those that don't know Christ. Any questions on what I'm saying, I want to make certain I'm saying it clear about having the Holy Spirit and not being in sin. Let me, let me check and make certain I got it right. Can you as a Christian commit a sin? Yes. Will you remain in sin? Hmm? You're not going to. You are not going to. The Holy Spirit is even doing it. Well, let's do that. Now, it may take a minute. It may take a minute. I've known some people that took a minute. Some people that are really fired up doing great things for God now that, that spent a little time and it really came down to Satan got his minion into the, the, the mixed in with the body of Christ and that minion not being a Christian was there for no more purpose than to cause divisions and to cause the weak to stumble and they stumble and they stay out for a while but you will come back will be drawn back to Christ. Or he's going to set you aside or take you out altogether. You're a stumbling block to those that he would draw to himself or to those that, are, that he is growing in his likeness. A true believer will exhibit a Christ-like life. Can you stray from that? Yeah. Just wait. You ever see me lose my temper? It's not going to be very Christ-like. It's going to tell you. You know, Jesus made a, a scourge of cords and drove the people from the temple saying, this is my father's house. Maybe I'm just going to need to stew out of them and figure out why later. It won't be very Christ-like. But, so, Christians can mess up. But one of the marks of a Christian, even after they mess up, is because they have the spirit. They get it back right. And they should be continuing to grow even more Christ-like after that point. That makes sense. Yeah, I thought exactly what I asked if they bring it home. I said I'm glad to see it to Sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, I have a lot of concern. We, we've seen the infiltration of Satan into other denominations. And we've seen them infiltrating slowly but surely into the Southern Baptist, individual churches, individual leaders, but have, you've slowly been seeing this growth of anything but Christ even in the convention now. Uh, the, the first warning signs that we had on the level of the convention was when it became more important to make a big to-do about things like condemning the uh, Confederate flag. Uh, but you saw less and less effort going out to missions. 
the local Paul Harrison mission, they used to be all kinds of stuff going on, sponsored by them, uh, people that were part of the association, the work that they were going out and doing locally. There was always something going on. And, and you see less and less and less of that. Even before you get to anything like sexual scandal in the convention, uh, before you get to anything like people that have committed fraud within the conventions, the lack, the vast majority of the efforts of the convention ought to be in evangelism. That is the number one job of the church. Let's reach people for Christ. And that right there was the first sign there was problems, and that began to decline more and more and more and more. Even before you throw all this other stuff in the mix. And, and that's the thing about this infilling with the Holy Spirit that I can point out right there. If you have the Holy Spirit of God within you, and God is love, and you are being filled to the maximum so that it is overflowing, then there ought to be people around you feeling that love. Right? You, you ought to be throwing that love of Jesus on. They ought to be able to feel it and know it. If people don't see your Christ-like behavior, if they don't feel that there's something different about you, that you care for them, then you need to check up on how close you are to this, with the Spirit. Uh, perhaps, and I'm not saying you're not a Christian here, but it is possible, and we'll get to this uh, probably next week, there are ways in which you can offend the Holy Spirit. And, and, and you can have a little bit of a uh, Tension between the two of you, if you will, a little bit of strife, a little bit of, uh, you don't have that open flow of communication, that spirit of spirit filling you with power while you're living and walking in the spirit. It can happen. We'll talk more about that. I think it'll be next week. Like I said, we're spending a lot of time on the spirit. Because there's so much about the spirit that's either not understood or misunderstood. And this Holy Spirit is responsible for so much and so crucial to the Christian life. Uh, for example, let's go to Galatians chapter 5. What's my time since I didn't learn my watch today? 1027. Good, I got another hour. <laughs> chapter 5, and uh, we'll start with uh, 16. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, <coughs> fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. You can see a real absence of the Holy Spirit in the world today. 
You can see where mankind has resisted and resisted and resisted the pull of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit to draw them to Christ. And you see, I mean, turn on the news, uh, and, and how many of these works of the flesh do you see? It's ridiculous. You know, we, we were talking up in up in near where we live. There was recently a case. Uh, a mother went nuts and started killing her children. Uh, killed what? Two on the scene. Killed three. Or three on the scene. Another one dies in the hospital a day or so later. Sent, sent like three of them to the hospital, two dead on the, two or three dead on the scene. And uh, since she couldn't get the two teenagers, she sets the house on fire trying to get for them. And we were talking about that. We're like, how in the world could a mother do such a thing? You know, men do not have typically that same gentle, nurturing spirit that a woman does, particularly even for her offspring. You, you, uh, you know, the, a woman can become a, a she-bear <laughs> to protect her, her offspring. And while men can become my warriors and protect their offspring, it's still not that same nurturing, you know, uh, spirit within a man that a woman has. That's why you typically, if you see a serial killer, particularly where the the young or the frail are involved, it's, it's going to be a guy. It's just not a typical thing within a woman. And yet we're seeing it more and more and more. And the Bible talks about in the last days, people will not have natural affection. They will lose that natural instinct to care for others and to be kind to others. And it's because the power of Satan is growing in these last days. Satan, he knows his time is short. He's going to all out warfare. And people have rejected the Holy Spirit, rejected the Holy Spirit, even got people in the church now who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. They're, they're holding the Holy Spirit at bay, if you will, uh, by so many that are in the church that are not Christians. But even among those that, that are Christians, you're finding that they're becoming more and more and more distracted by the things there are. And, and so these things are, are growing like crazy. And you can see that how all of these are or, or, or the things of sin and evil and not of the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, right there in that verse 16 and 17, he reinforces what was said in Romans chapter 8, that the spirit and the flesh are contrary to one another. And that if you are walking in the spirit, you are not going to be fulfilling the lust of the flesh. So what does the Spirit give to us but good fruit? You can tell one that belongs to Christ because they bear good fruit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is growing good fruit in them. And what is that good fruit? But we have love, joy, and peace. We have long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. Uh, we have faith, meekness, and self-control. The good fruit of the Spirit will be growing in somebody that belongs to Christ. And because you have good fruit growing in you, you know, a tree that ha bears good fruit is going to bear good fruit. A tree that bears corrupt fruit is going to be bearing corrupt fruit. And we can judge fruit. We can see fruit and see what kind of person uh, we are dealing with. Uh, does that mean we... we Judge them to condemnation. Now, if you see somebody that's bearing bad fruit, the first step is you're going to be praying. The next step is you're going to be sensitive to the Spirit if they need you to witness to that person, to 
bring them salvation or if it's a brother or sister that's got sideways and needs to be brought back that's for the Holy Spirit to tell you and empower you to do because we are expected to look out for our brothers and sisters we're supposed to bear one another's burdens we're supposed to if we see one taken in a fault to go to them and try to bring them back into uh, the our correct walk because we can make mistakes of sin but it's, we cannot stay there and one of the, 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 the things that the Holy Spirit uses to make certain people don't stay in sin that are Christians is other Christians that are walking in the Spirit so let's take a look at some of these fruits you've got love, joy and peace now these are these are really your relationship with God the Father God the Spirit is going to bring about good fruit in you that are love, joy, and peace in relation to God the Father. Okay? Now, I was talking a minute ago about, you know, you got love in you because of the Holy Spirit. That love flows out to others, which is true. But you got to go to the source of love. First, Scripture tells us God is love. He is the very source. Love is not just something He fills or gives or shows. It is a very part of his character, a very part of his nature. He is the source of love. And so if we're in a right relationship uh, with the Holy Spirit and dwelling in us, then we are going to be receiving and sharing back and forth love to God, which makes it possible to share love to others. Uh, we're going to have joy. We talk all the time about the peace that passes understanding that there again comes from the Holy Spirit. In our relationship to God. Uh, the next three we have are relative to our fellow man. Long suffering. That is a, a one, wonderful gift from the Holy Spirit. Let's face it, we, we know how we are, right? So I know it takes long suffering to deal with me sometimes. And I know it takes a lot of long suffering. There's a lot of times I'd much rather deal with my machines when they're acting crazy than people. You know, the Lord has to keep working on that one. Being long suffering, you know, I got you out there to be a witness. You're going to have to be around people. No, 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 no. Let me just talk to the machine. Now, you've got to develop some long suffering. People are hard to deal with. They are. Why? Because we've all got our job. We've all got our stubborn streaks or our, our misconceptions or our crazy opinions or times when we're selfish, whatever. So the Spirit gives us long suffering to deal with our fellow man. We should be gentle with our fellow man. We should have a spirit of gentleness about us that we get from the Holy Spirit. He grows that good fruit in us, then people are able to see that good fruit and know we belong to Christ. Less and less, the world is about gentleness. All the time, you see, I'm road rage. Good example, right there. That, that is no long suffering and there's no gentleness taking place there. And what is road rage? But arrogance. Oh, you cut me off. Oh, you're driving too slow. Oh, this, oh, that. I don't care what the law says, I'm passing you on the double yellow. Why? You can't pass me on the double yellow, now I'm going to run you off the road. It's all arrogance. It's all that is. You don't see a lot of gentleness in the world. You think how many times you go to a, a, a drive through or something, and people are just, there's no courtesy. There's, they're, they're impolite, they're rude. They, you know, there's a time to speak directly. Time to be uh, a little blunt. But most of the time you should be polite and courteous and tactful because that is that comes out of having that spirit of gentleness and the way we should deal with each other. But the crazier the world gets, the less of it you see. A spirit of goodness, being good to other people, being good in our behavior. You know, that righteousness, we are different from others because we are good. They can see that goodness within us because of the Spirit dwelling in us. Apart from Christ, there is no goodness. 
Uh, Isaiah 64, 6 tells us that all our righteousness is filthy rags. But with the Holy Spirit, we have goodness. We have been made righteous. We are being made righteous. We will be righteous. Do we see, uh, for living our own life, faith? I've said it before and I'll say it again. Apart from the Holy Spirit, you don't have faith. The very faith you need to believe has to come from the Holy Spirit. None comes to the Father unless they are drawn by the Spirit. And to have that faith to trust the Father comes from the Spirit. A spirit of meekness, a spirit of self-control, all these things are gifts from the Holy Spirit. The better our lives, the better our relationship with others, the better our, our relationship with God, and people see these good fruits growing in us and being uh, exhibited to the world, and these are the things that draw them to Christ and help them to grow in Christ. Uh, we find also in these same passages, and we'll get more into this next week, that the Spirit is the guide for the believer's life. He is the one, and I've touched on this a little bit, uh, and you see it a lot in the book of Acts, but He is the one who calls you to service and, and, and equips you to that service. You know, the, if you're, an example of this would be uh, the Apostle Paul saying, you know, or even before the Apostle Paul, the Lord Jesus Christ telling his disciples when he sent them, don't worry about what you're going to say when you stand before these judges and rulers, but the Spirit will direct your words. So think on that some, and we can jump more into the Spirit being the guide in the believer's life. The Spirit determining what our area of service should be and equipping us for that. Any thoughts or questions? Yeah, and you can feel the Spirit more, more times than not. Or is your level of Spirit with living the and leading by the the same? Okay. You always have the Holy Spirit, if you are a believer, living within you. He fills the temple up. It's like when the, the Shekinah glory of God filled the Holy of Holies in the Old Testament. It filled it up so that, you know, it, it, was, it was visible even from outside that, that God was there. Well, the Holy Spirit is going to fill you and dwell you to that, that maximum extent. Now, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, where you get that extra a double portion, so to speak, as I used the, the example of Elijah and Elisha, uh, you get that extra empowerment, that extra preparation for service or strength that you're going to need, and, and it can even carry over into uh, miracles, as we saw with, with the apostles, you know, raising people from the dead, healing people that are sick. You know, oh, those apostles didn't do that. That was the work of the Holy Spirit through you. It should be going on. When you're talking about the Holy Spirit filling you up, empowering you, it's, it's, it's different, different from Him living within you. When you're talking about Him filling you up, it, it, it empowering you to that service, to that challenge, to that emergency, that should be a thing that goes that happens again and again and again as it is needed to the point that it is a continuous ongoing thing. Just like dragging those steel pumps with you, you know, they're still filling you to overflowing. Um, it, 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 it doesn't stop. And what well, you you can you can soil it around if you're a Christian and you grieve the Holy Spirit, um, if you do something to put distance between you and the Lord, commit that sin until you repent and get back on the right track, yeah, you can slow it down. He's still going to be living within you. If ever you are a Christian, you are a Christian. <clears throat>
time to go 